After reading about some of these stories, uh, I think I might need to attend an exorcism at some point before I die, adding it to the bucket list. You know, I just really want to see if any of this stuff actually happens. I'd like to see someone levitate, you know, would you not? Anyway, I'm your host James, and these are the top 10 exorcisms in history scarier than Annalise Michelle. And we're kicking off this list with the oldest case on the list, the exorcism of George Lucas in 1787. George Lucas, a seemingly pleasant and devout man who worked as a Ventriloquist, a singer, an actor in the village of Euton near Bristol, England, became known for his bizarre behavior after suffering a fall. He would have violent outbursts, convulsions, and speak in tongues. Desperate for answers, his family and neighbors sought the assistance of Reverend Joseph Easterbrook, an experienced clergyman known for his expertise in dealing with demonic possessions. And on Friday the 13th, 1787, Easterbrook, along with 12 other associates, began an exorcism. As the ritual started, Lucan's body contorted in unimaginable ways. Witnesses reported hearing guttural growls as Lucan's laughed and sang, claiming to be the devil. This went on for hours until his normal voice suddenly returned and he was seemingly freed. Next up, we have a very famous one, Roland Doe. This went down in 1949 in Cottage City, Maryland. So uh, Roland Doe, a German-American boy, uh, also Roland Doe, not his real name, mind you, starts to experience some strange stuff. Furniture moving on its own, weird noises echoing throughout the house, you know, all the classic signs of supernatural shenanigans going on. And naturally, his family gets freaked out and decides to seek the help of the Catholic Church. The priests step in and agreed to perform an exorcism on Roland. During the exorcism sessions, Roland's body would convulse uncontrollably and his voice would transform into this deep, growling tone that was definitely not his own. And according to some accounts, the kid would even levitate and showcase freakishly strong bursts of power. You can definitely see the inspiration here for a lot of the exorcism tropes we see in all sorts of movies today. And the priests, they have to do everything, apparently, that they could to restrain him using holy water and reciting prayers. The whole ordeal dragged on for weeks with multiple exorcism attempts until they finally claimed victory over the malevolent forces apparently possessing him. Next, we have the case of Arne Cheyenne Johnson. Now, this is a bit of a complicated story, so pay attention. Uh, this is a case involving the famed paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren, by the way. So, uh, back in 1981, Arne Johnson was accused of a chilling murder. He had stabbed his landlord to death in the middle of a dispute. But what's peculiar is that during the trial, his defense claimed that he committed the act while under the influence of demonic possession. According to the Warrens, prior to taking Bono's life, Johnson's fiance's younger brother, David, had been dealing with what they believed to be demonic possession. The Warrens were called in to investigate, and they concluded that an exorcism was necessary to save the young boy. And during the exorcism, David had supposedly levitated into the air, predicting the death of Bono at Arne Johnson's hands. Arne had apparently taunted the demon and allegedly invited it to possess him instead. And several months later, Johnson had taken Bono's life. Fast forward to the trial, and the defense's team attempted to introduce the supernatural defense of demonic possession. The Warrens testified in court, asserting that Arne was indeed possessed at the time of the crime. However, the judge ruled that such a defense was not admissible, and Arne was convicted of manslaughter. The case of Arne, uh, Cheyenne Johnson, is often cited as one of the most prominent instances where the Warrens claimed involvement with a case of demonic possession. Next up, we have the exorcism of Amy Stamatis. A 49-year-old nurse and resident of Searcy, Arkansas, Amy Stamatis began acting strangely one day. She was in the middle of writing a report when she claimed to have suddenly, seemingly, forgotten how to do her job. She ended up quitting her job and having been a life long runner, found that she was also suddenly unable to do that. Her behavior slowly became more and more erratic until one day she leapt from the roof of her own home. Now paralyzed from the waist down, Amy claimed to hear demonic voices whispering in her ears. She claimed to have turned everywhere she could in search of answers until she met a Pentecostal evangelist by the name of Cindy Lawson, who suggested performing an exorcism on her. The ritual was apparently successful, although Amy remembers 
fingers, none of it. But according to her and her family, there was an immediate change in her behavior once it was over. Number six, Latoya Ammons. The following case unfolded in 2012. Latoya Ammons claimed that she and her family were tormented by supernatural occurrences and demonic possession after moving into their new home in Gary, Indiana. According to reports, the Ammons family experienced a range of bizarre phenomena. They had heard disembodied voices. They saw a shadowy figure of a man pacing around in their living room. Her daughter had apparently levitated. They heard doors opening and closing on their own. The case gained momentum when local authorities, including police officers and social workers, actually attested to witnessing strange events in their home. They claimed to hear the children speaking in demonic voices, behaving abnormally. One caseworker saw one of the kids walk up the wall backwards, apparently. Soon, a Catholic priest agreed to perform an exorcism on Latoya and her children. The exorcism conducted in the presence of witnesses, mind you, supposedly involved prayers, holy water, religious rituals aimed at expelling these alleged demons. And those involved in the exorcism actually claimed to have witnessed a significant change in the behavior and well-being of the family following the ritual. Michael Taylor. In 1974, in the town of Osset, England, Michael Taylor, a married man and father, was involved in a Christian fellowship group. And during this time, he began exhibiting signs of extreme paranoia, claiming that he was possessed by demons. Concern for his well-being, the group's leaders decided to perform an exorcism on him. The exorcism lasted for an entire night, during which Taylor's behavior became increasingly erratic and violent. Witnesses reported seeing him speaking in different voices, contorting his body in unnatural ways, and displaying immense levels of strength. Despite their efforts, the exorcists were unable to free Taylor from what they believed to be demonic possession. Disturbingly, shortly after this failed exorcism, Taylor would return home and take the life of his wife, Christine, in a fit of violent rage. He was found covered in blood later on, wandering through the streets, claiming that he had taken the life of the devil. Number four, Clara Germana Sell. Clara was an orphan born in 1890 in Natal, South Africa. She spent her entire upbringing in St. Michael's Mission. At 16 years old, Clara began exhibiting strange behavior. In one instance, she was seen running down the hallways, taking off her clothes, and speaking to someone who didn't appear to be there. Clara eventually told priest Father Horner Erasmus that she had made a pact with the devil. Witnesses claimed that she was able to speak in languages that she had never been taught, could tell people things about their lives that she had no way of knowing, and had even been seen levitating. An exorcism took place where Clara apparently displayed high levels of physical strength, able to hurl nuns across the room, and once again, she was levitating in the air. It seemed to have worked until a few days later when a nun walked into Clara's room only to see her levitating yet again. So uh, the nun was like, all right, Right, here we go again, and a second exorcism took place, and this time Clara seemed to make a full recovery. In January 2005, Maricina Arena Cornici, a young Romanian nun, began hearing voices at 23 years old. She had come from a broken home and was raised in an orphanage. After moving to the Tanaku Monastery to become a nun, she began exhibiting strange behavior. She was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and after receiving treatment, was returned to the monastery where the priests and nuns decided they needed to perform an exorcism on her, with one of them stating they had witnessed the devil enter into her body. And sadly, she would not survive. She endured three days of brutal treatment, being bound to a cross where she was denied food or water and gagged with a towel to prevent her from cursing. After the three days, she was finally deemed cured and was fed but then passed out, at which point an ambulance was called and she died on the way to the hospital. Next, we have the Juanita Gomez case. This is a pretty baffling case. Juanita Gomez is now serving life without parole after taking her own daughter's life in an absolutely brutal fashion. On August 27th, 2016, Geneva Gomez, daughter of Juanita Gomez, was found dead in her mother's home, arms spread out in the shape of a cross, with a crucifix having been shoved into her 
her mouth. Geneva's boyfriend, who had found her, stated that he couldn't even recognize her face. Juanita was put under arrest and soon claimed that she needed to exercise the devil from her daughter's body and that she had bruises on her hands because she was, quote, trying to rid Satan from her daughter's body. She also claimed Geneva had been speaking in tongues and that a demonic voice had been coming out of her. And finally, I'll be looking at the case of Christy Bamu. This is a very disturbing case, and it really shows the dangers of these kinds of practices, honestly. Uh, although what happened here is definitely outside of the realm of a traditional exorcism, I suppose. Um, in 2010, 15-year-old Christy Bamu traveled from Paris with three of his siblings to meet with his older sister Magali and her boyfriend in London to celebrate Christmas. Magali and her boyfriend Eric soon started making some wild accusations at Christie, stating that he was practicing witchcraft and that he had demons inside of him that needed to be exercised. Over the course of several days, Christie would endure horrendous mental and physical torture at the hands of his very own sister, as well as her boyfriend Eric. Eric also began attacking Christie's other sisters, accusing them of being witches, but Christie took the brunt of the attacks, culminating in Magali and Eric submerging him in the bathtub in the form of a ritualistic cleansing. Sadly, he would not survive. But with all that said, I've been your host James, and I'll catch you, yes you specifically, in the next video.